Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 1st to 7th of November, 2021. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host, Jean Deville. This week, we bring an announcement of a new co-CEO from one of China's more recent commercial launch companies, an announcement from China's arguably first commercial launch company. But first, Jean is going to bring us an announcement of yet another constellation, this time collaboration between Space City and the Beijing University of Posts and Telecommunications. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. So, Jean, Space City and BUPT with another constellation. What's、uh, what's the situation there? So, just、uh, a week ago, on October the thirty first, we saw China's small set manufacturer, Space City, based in the city of Changsha in Hunan Province, sign a cooperation agreement, as you mentioned, Blaine, with the Beijing University of Posts and Communications, or BUPT, and this for a constellation called Tianxuan, or literally、uh, celestial calculations. For a start, it will be only composed of six satellites, with the first satellite BUPT one being launched in May 2022, and the rest of the satellites to be、uh, launched by the end of 2023. The objective of this constellation, to this day, is not exactly clear.、Um, it seems that this will be a technology verification constellation, described as quoting them here, carrying out preliminary research on intelligent digital infrastructure, providing technical support for the development of China's six G network, satellite internet, and other technologies. So make of that what you will. I think also the exploratory nature of this constellation makes the、um, presence, the participation of BUPT almost、uh, unsurprising. I, I'd say because BUPT is really one of the top tier Chinese universities and research institutes when it comes to telecommunications and when it comes to electronics. Also, the open source nature apparently of this project, according to the press release, also suggests that other research labs, other companies will be able to benefit and will be able to use、uh, this constellation.、And、this is probably Why at the signing ceremony there were the presence of other such、um, players, and just to give a few examples, we had the Institute of Artificial Intelligence of Beijing University. There was the Technology Research Lab of China Mobile, and there was also Huawei's Cloud Innovation Lab. Now let's look at this constellation. This constellation is a modest constellation. There are only six satellites, but I think it really puts into the spotlight the rather good situation the commercial small set manufacturer Space T is in today, because this comes just several weeks only after another announcement that we saw at the Zhuhai Air Show, and we saw notably Space T sign a cooperation agreement with the Institute 38 of CETC, the Chinese Electronics Technology Corporation, and this to launch and operate together a. Constellation of 96 SAR satellites called Tianxian, and SAR meaning synthetic aperture radar. And this comes 10 months after Space T launched its first SAR satellite called the Hisa One in December 2020. And this does suggest also that the result of this first satellite launched almost a year ago was、um, sufficiently satisfactory for CTC to decide to expand this single satellite experiment to 96 satellites. So overall, a really nice result for Space T. And I think one last thing to note, and not the least, is that both partners slash customers of these two aforementioned constellations are state-owned research institutes or state-owned players. And this is really noteworthy in the sense that these、um, institutes could have gone to state-owned small set manufacturers such as Shenzhen Dongfang Hong or Shanghai Microsat, and yet they chose a commercial company based in Changsha. And this probably suggests. That、um, Space T was able to bring to the table a unique value proposition, and so that's definitely、uh, one point to note. And the other one is that state-owned enterprises today can very well support commercial companies, and that's something definitely to note. So I think definitely a very,、um, I think definitely a very noteworthy update this week, Blaine. What, what are your thoughts on、uh, on Space T and、uh, BUPT? For sure, and I. Yeah, for sure, and I have my my speculation of what is the unique value proposition that Space City is is bringing, but I'll get to that in in just a moment. So first of all, big fan of the name、uh, Tianxuan. So the, the celestial calculation is just a really very poetic name, it seems like. So definitely,、um, they have a fan of the name in me from that、uh, from that regard. 
Um, so just to unpack a couple more points, and then again, I'll get to the Space City's unique value proposition. Um, so I would point to another article that we saw this week from the Global Times that was reporting that the contract for this constellation was actually between Space City and a BUPT research institute in Shenzhen. And that makes it even more noteworthy, I would think, that a company like Shenzhen Dongfang Hong was not chosen. Uh, the article also does note that the construction of the constellation would also be based in Shenzhen, which is particularly interesting given that up until now, uh, as far as I know, Space City does not have any of their manufacturing capabilities in the city of Shenzhen. And the last point that the article notes in regard to geography is that there will be apparently a Greater Bay Area component to the constellation, GBA Greater Bay Area, referring to um, the cluster of cities around Shenzhen, namely Hong Kong, Guangzhou, Dongguan, Foshan, and a handful of others. Um, so to Sean's earlier point, I think, about the, the purpose of the constellation. So the article from the Global Times also quotes who was as calling the constellation a scientific research platform. And I think that when we look at it from this perspective, the selection of Spacity, if anything, is almost a validation of Spacity's uh, what they call satellite as a service or space as a service um, value proposition. And so this is to say Spacity, over the last few years, they built a decent business of providing a satellite platform or space on a satellite platform for companies that are trying to do in-orbit testing and verification of specific products, so whether that would be antennas or thrusters or what have you. And the idea is that Space City regularly launches satellite buses into orbit, and these satellite buses are pretty modular and they're pretty flexible. And so you can have a value proposition of if you're a commercial space company that wants to test your product and you need to get into orbit in the relatively near future, Space City has this value proposition for you. And if we think about the Tianxuan constellation, it sounds like a kind of similar concept, except more specifically for science and technology research, and particularly for like 5G, 6G, other kind of networking types of technologies. Um, and again, it's a little bit speculative, but my feeling is that Space City's experience in doing this kind of tech verification space as a service type of business model, building satellites that are specifically designed to allow flexibility of other people's instruments to be put on these satellites, I presume this would have been a pretty strong, you know, pretty compelling value add if you were Space City and if you were bidding for, for this project. Um, so I guess just the last couple of points as it relates to this project. So um, I guess expanding a little bit on an earlier point from Jean, just kind of the wide variety of quite powerful actors that seem to be involved in this deal. So um, this includes, among others, so I, I found quite interesting, the, the addition of the Guangdong Provincial Next Generation Communication and Network Institute. So the Guangdong Sheng Xin Dai Tong Xin Yu Wang Luo Chang Xin Yan Jiu Yuan. Uh, it's a provincial government institute that basically sounds like they are developing next generation network technology. So again, kind of a provincial government fund institute. Um, then we also have, a, again, the BUPT Shenzhen branch. So this is a very, very prestigious national level university. Uh, and then again, we have one of China's largest tech firms in Huawei. We have a national uh, technology research lab of China Mobile and Space City. And which is to say you have these really, really big players, you know, provincial governments or big SOEs doing a very big project. Um, and then Space City, as a very small piece of this, doing their core business, which is the space element. And so I think moving forward, we need to keep an eye out for Chinese commercial space companies being able to play quite important roles in very big projects that are very specific to space because you're going to see more large Chinese institutions, whether it's big SOEs or provincial governments or research institutes, getting involved in the space sector. So definitely pretty interesting. And this last, last point I would mention, um, it's possible, although it does not say specifically, that there is some connection here to the Guangdong Government Digital Economy Development Plan published in August, which we referred to last week, uh, sorry, at, at that time on the Dongfang Hour. Uh, so, Jean, anything else from your side on, um, on the Space City BUPT constellation? I'm good. Excellent. Okay. So moving on to our second piece of news of the week, we have a short update on one of China's newest commercial launch companies, which is I guess Orion Space, or also known as O Space, uh, or Dongfang Kongtian. And so the company announced this week the appointment of a new co CEO, that is Yao Song. And uh, this is an interesting piece of news, really just because of Yao Song's background, I suppose, and because of the position that Orion Space or O Space finds themselves in right now. So, just a very little bit of background on O Space. Uh, so, they burst onto the scene having been founded just last year, and then earlier this year, they raised a 400 million RMB round of funding. So a very big round of funding for a first round of funding. And in particular for a company that was, again, the 20th or 25th commercial launch company to be established in China. And the company is based over in Shandong province in, uh, in Yantai. And they likely have some connection with the provincial government in terms of a launch site that is being built there. Uh, but again, we have with Ospace, uh, you know, one of the several dozenth commercial launch companies in China, which is to say, 
they have a lot of competition. They have their work cut out for them, but they do apparently have pretty strong financial backing. And this uh, new co-CEO, Yao Song, uh, so he is 29 years old. He's the former uh, he's the uh, former co-founder and CEO of a company called Shenzhen Technology, which he sold for 300 million U.S. dollars a few years ago when he was 25. And uh, Yao is a graduate of Tsinghua University's Department of Electrical Engineering, which is to say one of the top programs at one of the top universities in China. And his coming over to this company as co-CEO, it occurred in a very interesting way. So there were a couple of interviews with Yao Song, a little bit of background on him during this week. And um, it was pretty clear that like he's a financially independent super genius who started a company that did AI powered semiconductors and other like really, you know, strategic and nationally sensitive kind of things. And then he sold the company and then he went and worked for uh, Xilinx, X-I-L-I-N-X, the company that bought uh, Shenzhen for a little while. He worked for them. And then he decided when he's 29 and multimillionaire and can do whatever the hell he wants for the rest of his life, that he's going to go and join the 25th ish commercial launch company in China as the co-CEO. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's it's speculating a little bit, but it seems like there must be some kind of personal interest there by this guy towards space. I mean, he does. He mentions this in interviews that were given with him this week. Um, but, yeah, just, I think a really interesting comment on on the ability or of the space sector in China now to attract really, really top talent, which is to say people that have a lot of money and a lot of ambition and who can do literally anything they want. And they're coming and working for what is not by any means the leading Chinese commercial launch company. Um, so yeah, really interesting stuff. And I guess just a couple of very last points on O space that emerged from these articles. So the company now apparently already has 70 employees, so they're growing very quickly. And apparently they do plan, uh, sorry, they are close to Sorry, their, uh, their Yinli-1 or their Gravity-1 rocket has entered preliminary production test stages. So we got a couple of updates on O-Space as a company. And again, new co-CEO, Yao Song, Wonder Kid, age of 29, and also a Forbes Asia 30 under 30. Now, Jean, I understand we have another update this week from a former Forbes Asia 30 under 30 Wonder Kid who has a commercial launch company, because how could you only have just one of those situations in any given country? Would you like to tell us what's going on with Link Space, or do you have anything else on O-Space for the week? The Gravity One rocket that you mentioned is planned for its uh, maiden launch in 2023. But going back to uh, the Wonder Kids and their launch companies, this week we heard uh, we saw a sign of life from a company that had been stealthy for literally two years. We are talking about Link Space, the first commercial company ever to be founded in China. We're talking about January 2014, and it was founded by arguably one of the youngest founders, not just in China, but maybe worldwide in terms of launch companies. We're talking about Hu Jenny, who was barely 21 years old at the time of the founding of the company. So back to the piece of news uh, of this week, Link Space announced the successful completion for, of, a, of a batch of tests of its first pump fed engine called the Feng Bao One, which literally means Storm One. And these tests were said to investigate pump system efficiency, variable working condition capabilities, and engine throttling. Link Space is known, to, just to give a little background on the company, they're known to be the uh, first Chinese company to have successfully completed a number of vertical takeoff, vertical landing hops or tests, thanks to five successive prototypes, all called RLVT, something to something being a number between one and five, and RLV meaning reusable a launch vehicle. The company was noteworthy for developing this type of technology from day one, as opposed to the other uh, commercial launch companies in China, just to give a few examples like Landspace, iSpace, and Galactic Energy. These guys rather had this uh, solid first liquid second uh, strategy that we described previously on the Dongfang Hour, which means first building a small if expendable solid fueled rocket because it's just uh, more simple to do that and you can acquire the the engines of the solid fueled engines potentially from a state-owned provider whereas liquid fuel will only come second as well as reusable so we, we can see how link space in this regard stands out compared to the others this news is also noteworthy because it's the first sign of link space developing more sophisticated engines and so again some background on liquid fueled engines i want to add here liquid fueled engines are generally either pump fed or they're pressure fed and pressure fed engines uh, are the most simple configurations when you have the propellants under high pressure in tanks and you have a system of valves that open up and that are able to release the propellants directly into the combustion chamber thanks to the high pressure in the tanks. And this is sufficient to, you know, um, bring the propellants in the combustion chamber and produce thrust. Um, so that's the first point. The disadvantage, of course, of this simple layout is that they are generally not adapted to, um, you know, rocket first stages where you want to produce a lot of thrust and where you're really burning a lot of propellant. 
Um, and Link Space's previous engine used on their RLV T5 prototype was exactly that. It was a pressure-fed engine consuming ethanol and liquid oxygen. Link Space's new engine, the Fengbao 1, on the other hand, is a pump-fed engine, meaning that there is a, either a turbo pump or an electrical pump pumping the propellants from the tanks into the combustion chamber. And this enables higher thrust, but at the expense of complexity. But this will enable Link Space to go beyond the several hundred meter hops it had performed previously and build a suborbital and orbital rocket prototype. Last interesting point about this test, it's actually a surprising turn of events to see Link Space develop their own engines. Because in the summer of 2019, after their successful 300 meter hop with the RLV T5 prototype, well, basically Link Space signed a collaboration with Jojo Engine, an engine manufacturer that we mentioned in last week's episode, to use their Ling Yun 10 ton thrust Methlox engine. But you know, the latest news that we have about Feng Bao One being developed in-house by Link, Link Space probably suggests that this collaboration with Jojo Engine did not go as uh, you know as well as planned. And lastly, on the topic of this engine manufacturer, Jojo Engine, the company performed a variable thrust and gimbling hot fire test which resulted in some very cool footage being published on social media. And this is something I'll put up here. Uh, but for the sake of keeping this episode contained, you'll have to go to our newsletter to read more about this test. And uh, with that, uh, Blaine, any final thoughts on Jojo and Jin or, or Link Space? Oh, yeah. Just my last final comment is the uh, phrase that we often mention, and it's always just fun to say at times like this, is that it is indeed very hard to create a Chinese commercial space company, but it is, in fact, even harder to kill a Chinese commercial space company. And that is to say, we see these companies that will go along for months or even years without a whole lot of an update on anything and will have written them off as being gone. And then all of a sudden, they will make some announcement of a big funding round or a new hire or a new technological development, and they'll be right back in uh, in the thick of things. So great to see Link Space back, uh, back on the scene. And as far as I recall, new-ish CEO about a year and a half ago, right? They brought in kind of adult supervision, and I think who is now kind of <laughs> overlooking the technical side of things, which is probably yeah. good. Um, so yeah, hopefully we get to talk about them more often. But um, in the meantime, indeed, check out um, the newsletter for more information on uh, on Jojo Yunjian, or check out last week's episode. And um, with that being said, this has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 1st to 7th of November. 2021. And uh, I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host, John DeVille, and we will see you next time. Bye.